Are your players stuck to their phones during your D&D sessions and you don't know how to recapture their attention? Well, there's one surefire way to do that, by boosting player immersion. Welcome creators, I am Holistic Dungeon Master and I help DMs master their craft with helpful videos like this one where we explore the top seven ways to increase player immersion that will have your players putting down their phones as they are ensorcelled by your dungeon master prowess. If you're enjoying my content so far, then please like the video, crit the subscribe button and notification bell. Now let's get rolling! When I started playing Dungeons and Dragons, I started first and foremost as a Dungeon Master, right? That's how I learned the game and who boy was it rough going at the start. I'm very lucky to have had a group of friends who were also new to the game, lucky me, and they were also very, very patient with my efforts to learn the ropes of running Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. I railroaded, I stuttered, I forgot NPCs, and I didn't know what any of the PCs abilities did, but slowly, session by session, I got better. I got so much better, in fact, that I no longer spent time in session worrying about how good or how bad I was doing, and the game started finally to flow naturally between the whole group. I still had a long way to go, of course, but it was becoming fun instead of nerve-wracking heading into a session. There was still a huge, glaring issue, though. My players were whipping out their phones when they weren't actively engaged in combat or roleplay, and I often had to repeat my descriptions or the general situation to my unengaged players. This drove me absolutely insane, and at the time, because I was a highly unenlightened and insecure dungeon master, I did what I usually did when sessions didn't go how I wished them to go. I blamed my players. <laughs> I know. Shameful. I stewed over this for such a long time, for a very long time, until I came to the startling revelation that changed my approach to DMing across the board. It's my responsibility as the DM to provide an experience engaging enough to keep my players off their phones and in the game. And so I fervently took to researching the best ways to boost player engagement and really draw them into the game so we could all share in this mass hallucination where we slay dragons and carouse in local taverns. The whole point of the game is to provide an escape from the real world and its issues. So getting my friends off their phones and into this fantasy realm was something I desperately wanted to give them. I tinkered, I experimented, I tested and tried and tried again until I have found, I reckon, the top seven ways to boost player immersion. And finally, my sessions went from start to finish without a single phone being whipped out. Except for the bricks, obviously. <laughs> Let me show you these techniques that you can start using right away so you can skip all of that testing and tinkering and improve your player's immersion during your very next session. But first, I'd like to give a huge shout out and thank you to my Patreon people for supporting the channel. More about how you can support the channel at the end of the video. When can you tell that you're reading a good book? And I mean a really, really good book. Well, when you stop feeling like you're reading it. You just imagine in your mind's eye the story being told to you. The sights, the sounds, the smells, the feelings, and even the tastes. I've been rereading The Witcher Saga and Andrei Sapkowski... Sapkowski. Andrei Sapkowski... Sab Sapkowski? Sapkowski. I've been rereading The Witcher Saga and Andrei Sapkowski is a master of this. He creates a full sense of immersion by utilizing the five senses, all of them. When Geralt is trudging through the muck, tracking some vile monster, Sapkowski goes the extra mile to describe the mellifluous odors, the feeling of cold and slimy muck clinging to his boots, and the horrendous sounds of monsters and the environment that Geralt is experiencing. We must do this. Also, utilizing just the visual sense when narrating is a missed opportunity. Four other missed opportunities, uh, to be precise, the extreme ones. We experience the whole world with all of our senses, all five of them. So get your players experiencing yours, your world, with them too. The astonishing sight of lush forests and imposing craggy cliffs, the chattering and whistling of birdsong, the babble of crowd, at the market and the susurration of leaves. But don't stop there, the smell of stew bubbling on a smoky cook fire, the stale sweat and ale stench of a tavern. Even magic can have a smell, right? I use burning ozone or tin, but let your creativity run wild, I'm sure you have your own preferences. Or how about the cold and stinging lash of sleet on uncovered faces, the piercing agony behind the eyes when hit by a psionic spell, or the vivifying warmth of a cottage Earth fire. Are you not already there in these places as I describe them to you? Your players will be too. Each sense you engage will amplify and multiply their belief in your world. 
sound is an especially powerful sense to evoke and engage along with the visual. I reckon that that's probably because of the way we experience movies and shows, right? It's mostly we're looking at it and hearing it. We're not really tasting it or touching it, but those are important too. I believe visual and sound together are extremely potent because of the way we consume media, especially fantasy media. So let's look at another way we can elevate our oral experience. A soundtrack can make or break a good movie or show, can't it? Would Lord of the Rings be as epic without its timelessly awe-inspiring score? Can you imagine a movie or a show with no soundtrack at all? No, of course not. I'm sure there's some out there, but it would be missing something, wouldn't it? So why don't your games have one too? This can be more than just ambient background noise to fill in the silent moments between players talking and roleplay and you speaking also. Though it is great for that, filling in those kind of awkward blanks sometimes. However, you can and should create curated playlists for the different moods that might crop up in your games. Combat, mystery, suspense, whimsy, dungeon crawling, urban exploration. The sky is the limit really, and it kind of depends based on what kind of game you're running. But soundtrack composers and arrangers, they use music to highlight different emotions and use this to really form a connection between the audience and what's happening on screen. And you should too. If your party are in combat, how much more thrilling will it be and exciting if there's fast rhythmic music increasing the sense of danger and urgency? If they're delving deep into the Underdark, how will they feel if creepy, droning, suspenseful music was adding to the already deadly atmosphere of the place. Some wonderful moments can happen when the music hits just right, it lines up somehow, it, it happens magically, it lines up perfectly with your narration or your description or even just stuff that's happening in the game, maybe even NPC dialogue, to create some powerful and poignant moments for you and more importantly, your players. Speaking of NPCs, let's discover how to use them to draw your players even deeper into your world. I love Horizon Zero Dawn, this game right here. I 100%ed it and I was fully engrossed in the lore. You had to collect pieces of lore, there were collectibles in the open world and as you collected them they kind of gave you another little piece of the story that fleshed it out and gave you full insight into the events that led to the state of the world it's in when you jump into the game. The story immersed me, the voice acting however broke that spell almost Every time, the voice acting in that game is at best quite average. At worst, it's very, very terrible. It's comically bad sometimes. Bad voice acting it kind of rots away at the immersion built on a good narrative, like rust on a well-made sword. Now, as dungeon masters, we seem to have a lot of leeway about how good our voice acting is, right? Especially if we have some, just some great voices for our most important NPCs. Players are willing to forgive a lot if we do. But expectations have been raised by online actual play streams, the likes of Critical Role, Dimension 20, and beyond. No one expects pro-level voice acting from you, unless it's your job to do so. But if you don't at least have interesting voices or accents, it does break immersion now more than ever. Now everyone's kind of seeing this higher elevated standard of voice acting. At the very least, you should be practicing your important NPC voices and accents. Games without any voices are completely off-putting to me. I Personally, I can't stand them. If there's an actual play and the GM isn't at least putting some effort into the voices, I, I can't watch it. That's my personal preference, and I'm sure it's fine for some, but if those voices aren't at least semi-believable, then I am pulled completely out of the game and out of the experience. It breaks. It breaks the spell. It does. The players are no longer interacting with a believable fictional character and are just being told what the character is saying by the DM. It's a seemingly small difference, but it's extremely significant. I have a video about how to improve your NPC voices and I plan to make a much more in-depth one in the future now that I've learned a little bit more about it, so stay tuned for that if you want to improve your NPC voice acting game. You can find the older one in one of these quarters. In fact, I recommend that you pause this video, open that one in a new tab, watch it, take some notes, gain some inspiration, and come back here and finish this one. Did you do it? Great, okay, we'll continue with this video. Continue and move on we will. I think we've spent enough time on sound. Let's discuss the much more widely utilized, but no less important sense, the visual. You enter the clerk's office and they are seated behind their desk, busy at work. A serviceable description, no? 
I'm sure the party can at least visualize what a clerk's office in a fantasy setting would look like. They've seen it enough in movies and shows and they've read enough descriptions in books that the scene is probably popping into their head automatically. However, what if we try this instead? You enter the clerk's office, the hinges on the heavy ornate wooden door, swinging soundlessly. The scent of dried ink, candle tallow, and must make it difficult to breathe as you see a mousy-haired and grayish-skinned clerk scratching out sums and figures on parchment at their meticulously tidy desk. The brass scales, stacks of parchment, and writing implements wait neatly along the edges of the desk, which is surrounded back and sides by towering bookcases containing expensive-looking and well-worn leather-bound tomes. Now your players are there. Using visuals and some other senses too, you've given them context to the situation, the location, and the NPC. You've made this place and its denizen more believable as you've hinted at the human habits and mannerisms of this person and how they utilize the space. You've made this place feel used and lived in. And that's the most important thing, to suspend disbelief. And you do that by making these scenarios and the people in them the locations they're surrounded by seem even more real. To be fair, I've had the benefit of thinking about that particular description and writing it out, but that's not far off how I'd improvise a scene description in-game. I sucked at it at first, for sure, but the more you try this, the great thing about it is the more you try it, the better you get at it, and the immersion deepens. By now, some of you sharper storytellers are beginning to realize something that I've been kind of hinting at since the start of the video. You'll just have to stick around to the end to find out exactly what the key to unlocking the true potential of all of these techniques is. But for now, let's talk about dice. Dungeons and Dragons is a game where we roll dice. There's no getting around it. Anything less and it would be a different tabletop RPG, right? It's fun, it's tactile, and we get to play with our fancy math rocks. And we love that. <laughs> the lizard part of our brain really enjoys that. However, it does pull away from the imaginative element of our games. There's no denying it. It pulls people back into the real. Here it is. It's right here. I, me, the player is holding this, not my player character, right? It does pull them away from fantasy. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, as I've said. The pros kind of outweigh the cons. We get to roll the shiny thing. And having a variety of different mediums of engagement is crucial. But rolling all of the time upsets that balance. Why roll three times when once will do? Instead, try replacing a potential unnecessary kind of redundant roll with a role play opportunity. Maybe the player, not the character, the player is good at fast talking and they've been convincing enough just by what they say, that they don't have to roll persuasion on a guard. They were persuasive enough with their eloquence. Maybe the player is a level eight rogue assassin and it just does not make any sense to have them roll initiative and spend 15 minutes alone in combat with a low CR flunky when you can just ask them to roll stealth and describe how they take this enemy out with their impressive and deadly skill set. Now you have your players role playing instead of rolling too many dice and that is immersion. Now we have the players captivated, if you've been using these techniques, of course, but we can go even deeper, even more arcane. We can keep this level of captivation high throughout each session, through the whole way through, by toying with our players' emotions. Okay, it's not as sinister as it sounds, I promise, but we can keep our players engaged and keep the narrative spicy by modulating our players' emotions using story beats and the hope-fear cycle. This is a huge and complicated topic, so I'll keep it as concise as I can. But a story beat is essentially anything that happens in your session that serves a purpose. Maybe it's the party getting closer to their goal, maybe it's you drop something that informs them about an enemy or situation or location. There are plenty of types and I discuss them all in length in this video here. I can never remember which bloody side it is because it switches over, right? But anyway, it's there. I recommend opening this one in a new tab and watching it after this video so you can really understand these different types of beats. How we use these story beats to increase engagement is to give each one a feeling of either hope or fear. Over the course of each session we want to modulate between these emotions. Too many hope beats and the session becomes boring. Too many down beats, too many fear beats and your players begin to feel like this session is kind of hopeless and kind of unfair. The right mix, however, keeps your party on their toes, emotionally speaking, and you get to take them on a roller coaster that is unpredictable and engaging. Again, this is a huge topic and I really recommend uh, learning more about it in my other video. Every other technique has been sort of 
tangible and fairly obvious to your players, but this is a little bit more esoteric. Nine times out of ten, your players won't even realize what you're doing. They'll just feel that the session is exciting the whole way through, and they will feel fully immersed and engaged with this game. Now, this last one is kind of similar, a little bit. It, again, it's kind of a behind-the-scenes DM thing that will transform your now highly immersive game into something that your players really just can't wait to jump back into. Railroading is bad for a very good reason. It takes agency away from the players. You never want to do that, not really. Your players are jumping into this fantasy realm so that they can have their PC do awesome stuff and have impact on this world. In other words, they want to feel important. Not railroading the players gives them more agency as they decide for themselves where they go and what they do. But to my mind, this is a kind of neutral level. Of agency. Not railroading brings it up to a kind of neutral level of player agency. So what's positive player agency? It's easy. Ensure that your player's choices, even the small itty bitty ones, have meaningful impact on the world. Imagine how important and awesome your players will feel when they've liberated some township from oppression that went on to grow into a flourishing and powerful settlement in the future. Or the mad scientist they save ends up massively changing the world for better or worse <laughs> with their inventions. It doesn't matter if it's a good or a bad thing, it just matters that it has impact and that the PCs, your players, had a hand in it. Not only are they now fully immersed with all of their senses, with their emotions, but now they can impact and change this world they're fully immersed in. Their decisions have weight and they really matter, so they need to make them carefully, just like you would in real life. This, to me, is what the game is meant to be. It's true potential. And now we finally come to the secret to reaching this potential. The key, the secret, is this. All of these techniques are powerful in their own right, separately. But holistically, yeah, yeah, it's the channel name, they are greater than the sum of their parts. They can all be intertwined and enmeshed to unlock this potential. Your vivid descriptions have engaged and ensnared all of your players' senses. The scene is further enhanced by your curated music playlists that suit the atmosphere and build on it. Your NPC voice is excellent and it suits the scenario and atmosphere you've created, drawing your players deeper and deeper and suspending disbelief even further and further. Your roles are minimal and unobtrusive, giving space for roleplay and letting your players really engage thoroughly with this scene. And from the next scene to the next to the next to the next, you're modulating hope and fear to keep your players locked into the scene without any of them getting stale. And finally, in this fantasy group sort of mass imagination that you've managed to make real in your players' minds, the players' choices impacted meaningfully, and now they are really a part of this world instead of just experiencing it. They are in the movie, not watching it. They are in the book, not reading it. Who would whip out their phone during this game? This is a lot of techniques to master, but you can start using them right away. It will start small at first, probably, while you level up these skills, but soon your sessions will vastly begin to improve. Like mine did, and you and your players will experience D&D at its true potential. And trust me, it is extremely gratifying as a DM to run a game that's even close to this. I still have a, a hell of a long way to go to reach this inspiring ideal that I just explained to you, but we can all learn from each other and get there together. That's the point of this channel. For the meantime, however, I have something to get you started. I've written a bunch of system-neutral, story-focused, archetypal NPCs that your players will resonate with on a subconscious level and increase their immersion. They've got no stats or mechanics or anything like that, so you can get started improving the narrative of your game no matter what system you're running. I'm giving it away for free and you'll find it down in the description below. Also down in the description you will find a link to my community Discord server where we can hang out, discuss the game, you can meet other DMs and players who love D&D. Just people who just love the game, right, and love to talk about it. I'll be posting my upcoming games on there too for any of those who wish to hire me as a DM. You've heard a lot from me, now I want to hear from you. In fact, we all do. Please get typing in the comments down below and let us know which of these techniques are you most eager to use. Do you use them already? If so, how have they impacted your games and your players? Let us know so we can foster this community of DMs who help each other 
own their craft. If you'd like to support the channel further, then please consider subscribing to my Patreon community. For $2 a month, you can find the link down in the description below and you will have a input, you will have a say in what content is created on this channel. If you've watched the video up until now, then you are the DM that I make these videos for. Someone who is truly dedicated to being the best DM that they can be. So thank you for watching all the way to the end. Please like the video, share it with a DM who you think could benefit from all of these techniques, crit the subscribe button and notification bell, and remember, please, that this world needs good DMs.